Okay, well, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a pleasure to remember Parta. Uh, he and I started working together in 2004 um, at a, an organization that was being formed then called now the Lena Research Foundation. Um, and uh, the task that was presented to us was uh, to help uh, a, an emerging company, which became a, uh, a nonprofit foundation, to develop a way that an all-day recorder could be used in homes of children and an automated recognition of uh, the material in those recordings could be utilized to some practical effect. Uh, the person who started this organization, Terry Paul, uh, envisioned at the time that we would do automatic speech recognition of the, uh, these recordings and that we would tell what sounds the children were producing and what meanings they entailed. Uh, and uh, so we advised him that that was an, uh, an awfully lofty goal, uh, that we might be wise to pare it down. Uh, and so uh, <clears throat> we persuaded him to, to instead develop um, a team of people who would, first of all, develop that all-day recorder, which was not a trivial task in itself. Uh, but second, to develop a way uh, to just recognize who was speaking, whether it was a female adult, a male adult, the child wearing the recorder, somebody else in the room, or other kinds of sounds that might be occurring in the room, just a, a, a labeling of those recordings. And, uh, and after that point, we thought, uh, if you can do that, then we can start building some additional elements into it. And ultimately, of course, we, we, we didn't uh, think that this idea of automatic speech recognition was totally unrealistic, uh, just, uh, just that it was out of reach, at least in the short run. So. Um, we began on this task with them. Let me quickly acknowledge that uh, my work is uh, supported uh, currently by an NIDCD grant, uh, and that Terry and Judy, Judy Paul are the uh, founders of the Lena Research Foundation, and uh, their, uh, their efforts in this particular realm, uh, financially speaking, have, uh, have made it all possible in a lot of ways. And I'm also supported by the Plough Foundation that supports my chair of excellence at the University of Memphis. Uh, the collaborators in this uh, particular project that I'm going to talk about today uh, are listed here in the uh, rough order of, uh, uh, of their, their role with me. Uh, I met Parta on the very first day that I went to Boulder, uh, where the, uh, this foundation is located. Um, we met at the airport and took a limousine together, and so he was the very first person associated with it that I had a chance to talk with. And it was, uh, in my opinion, a, a really fortuitous uh, uh, circumstance because uh, I'm... Uh, I felt incredibly engaged immediately. Uh, Parta was a, an awfully easy man to, to communicate with, and, uh, and I enjoyed for every minute that I ever had with him being able to do that. So anyway, a little uh, just concrete background now on this uh, automated analysis uh, approach and the, and the recorder. You see a little picture here of the, uh, of the uh, Lena recorder. Uh, it's just a little, uh, you know, iPod-sized device that is entirely battery-powered and can record for 16 hours. So it's an all-day recorder. Uh, and it uh, uh, is accompanied by, uh, with the software that you connect to after the recording is done, uh, an automated labeling algorithm for the waveforms, which uh, uh, has a whole background of its own, of course, which we can talk about a little. I'm not particularly expert in the methodology itself, but I can certainly describe it. Um, Another thing that the Lena Research Foundation has done is they've gathered, gathered over 80,000 hours of recordings from children in their natural environments using this device. So um, it's provided um, a database that we can do remarkable things with. And there's a great deal going on beyond what I'm going to talk about this morning uh, with, that, with that database and with accompanying bodies of recording uh, that are being made all over the world by now. So acoustic analyses of infant and child vocalizations in these recordings is, uh, is also possible, of course. Once you've identified who's speaking, you can select uh, portions to analyze uh, in special ways. And uh, that's what we're actually going to be talking about primarily this morning. So an analysis uh, that, that uh, Parta and I worked on together with the group of people that uh, were uh, listed before um, is based on a vocal development theory that I've been working on uh, since the 1970s. And uh, that vocal development theory provides us with perspective on what kinds of acoustic parameters actually change across time. And uh, they're not uh, simple acoustic parameters. They're, in some cases, rather 
uh, specific ones that are associated with aspects of the vocal system that we, uh, we deem to be infrastructural with regard to the emergence of the speech capacity. And so the data that we're going to review here today are primarily those published in the PNAS article in 2010 that's cited here. You can, you can find it easily enough by just typing in all or PNAS or something, and, uh, and you'll get the paper uh, and, and its supplementary material. And I'll tell you a little bit about some of the things that have happened since that paper was published. Incidentally, it was published in July of 2010, so just two months before we lost him. Uh, so anyway, here's, here's how this algorithm works. To, to start off with, you get the recording, and then you, the algorithm finds the child utterances. We're going to call them child utterance clusters, because they're really groupings of things that kind of fit together in time, indicated by this uh, automatic, uh, automatic method. So just roughly, so you can see what things look like. Uh, if we have a waveform like this um, uh, and a label like this, then this would be a child utterance cluster, uh, a sequence of events that, are, that all fit together in time. And then we have a silence of 900 milliseconds, and then another child utterance cluster, and then a, um, a, a sequence of events that is actually associated with another speaker. So the female adult is speaking there, and then another child utterance cluster. And in the next slide, we'll zoom in on the first of those child utterance clusters located by this uh, automatic, uh, automatic method. So just roughly, so you can see what things look like, uh, if we have a waveform like this um, uh, and a label like this, then this would be a child utterance cluster, uh, a sequence of events that, are, that all fit together in time. And then we have a silence of 900 milliseconds, and then another child utterance cluster, and then a, um, a, a sequence of events that is actually associated with another speaker. So the female adult is speaking there, and then another child utterance cluster. And in the next slide, we'll zoom in on the first of those child utterance clusters. And you'll see that it, uh, it actually has components within it as well. And the first one is the really interesting one, because it is actually one of these speech-related child utterances. Uh, it's not cry, as the last one is, or a vegetative sound, as the middle one is. Um, but it's actually something that sounds speech-like, and it's broken up into syllables. So this is the first syllable, and this is the second syllable. And that's the material we're interested in. And the analysis we're going to perform is going to be focused on those individual syllables. We'll keep track of how many utterances they occur in, how many of those child um, uh, utterances they occur in. But uh, we're interested in the syllables themselves for this analysis. And here's how the analysis actually works by the time we get to there. And it's the one that is based, as I said, on this theory of vocal development. So we're looking at 12. Uh, event types, and it's a very simple kind of an approach. First of all, we ask whether or not that syllable was voiced. That is to say, does an automatic pitch detection algorithm for more than 50% of the time period during which the syllable occurred detect a pitch? It's a simple kind of way of operationalizing this notion, notion of whether or not there's periodic vocalization or phonation occurring during the vocalization. The second one is a, a more subtle and, uh, and more difficult one to program. but uh, what it does is to seek what we call canonical syllable transitions. Um, a canonical syllable transition is a movement um, of the formants, the first and second formants primarily, from the onset of that syllable to some uh, designated point where uh, things stabilize, so to speak, in resonance. Um, and if that transition occurs within 120 milliseconds, that fast, it's deemed to be a canonical transition. And then the syllable will deem to be a canonical syllable. The third uh, parameter in this uh, first group, which we call rhythm and syllabicity, uh, is strangely related to it. But it turns out that it does fit together in principal components analysis. It's a uh, spectral entropy factor, which um, evaluates the whole entropy of the spectrum across the period of the syllable and asks the question to what extent uh, that uh, energy is random and noisy. But it asks it in a rather special way for reasons that are too hard to explain here now, but I'll, I'll try to go into them later with anyone who would want to hear it. Uh, what they're really doing is looking, what it's really doing is looking for a spectral entropy range that is typical of the kind of entropy that occurs in real speech, because we don't speak in fully periodic voiced uh, segments when we talk. We vary between um, um, high and low entropy uh, in a particular range. The second group of parameters of these 12 parameters are associated with high pitch uh, control and, and spectral tilt. The first one we just call squeal. And by that, we mean uh, that the vocalization has a very high pitch. It's got to be over uh, 600 hertz in the mean. The second one is a low tilt of the spectrum uh, 
parameter and the high frequency one is related to it. In both cases, they're looking for relatively high energies at the, uh, in the high end of the spectrum as, to, as opposed to the kinds of energies you see in the low end when you have perfectly uh, normal phonation in the kinds of range that we normally speak in. So this is the squeal group, so to speak, or the low spectral tilt group. And then there's a, uh, a group that's associated with low pitch um, or growling. Uh, and these are terms that are drawn from this literature in infant vocal development where children do develop uh, early in life vocalizations that, um, that include these kinds of properties. They squeal, they growl, they do sounds in between, and it's clear that they're, in fact, producing these in a way that is purposefully contrastive. Uh, so we look for the child's control over the ability to do that kind of thing. Uh, so growling is one of the uh, issues, and the, uh, if the syllable is under 250 hertz in, in pitch across that time period, then we deem it a growl. And associated with the, with the growl characteristic, there's a tendency for the first two formants to have wide bandwidths. And so that's the eighth parameter. And the last four are just about duration. So for these vocal islands or syllables, we ask the question, to what extent in four possible ranges do they, uh, or whether they fit in each one of four po possible ranges. And those ranges are associated with the durations of speech. So medium means this is the kind of duration that you typically find for a monosyllable pronounced in isolation in natural language. So if we give somebody a list of monosyllables to pronounce, they will tend to be produced with, uh, with durations in between 250 and 600 milliseconds. Um, a short uh, syllable tends to be between 110 and 250. Long ones, uh, over 600, as a matter of fact, they're very rare in real speech, but, uh, but they do occur extra long, over 900 milliseconds. So that's what we're actually looking for in this, um, in this effort. And I'll not, oops, I'll not go through further discussion of uh, what's over here. You can, you can read it uh, in the paper if you're interested. Now, uh, after having developed this scheme for doing analysis of the vocalizations in 2004 and 2005, I made the specifications of these uh, kinds of parameters to engineers who were working for the foundation, and they implemented them then. Um, in the meantime, they were developing the recorder, and they started acquiring recordings. And so uh, we didn't change this descriptive system, this algorithm for analyzing the vocalizations at all uh, from that point. Actually, we're starting to do it now. But through the point of the publication of the article, we didn't change it at all. So what we have is a, a set of completely independently prepared parameters um, and the way to analyze them uh, with regard to these syllables um, that were based on vocal development theory. Um, and uh, what we did then was we started trying to encourage the Lena Research Foundation to acquire recordings of children, not just who were developing typically. They were already doing that. They were developing a great, uh, a great sample from hundreds of kids from 2 to 48 months of age, very carefully stratified in terms of how they were sampled for socioeconomic status and such, all in the Denver area, but very nicely stratified. We started encouraging them to get s samples on autistic children as well. And um, the very first time that I spoke with Parta, of course, we, 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 we you know, sort of introduced ourselves in personal ways. I have an autistic grandson. Um, and uh, I, I'm sure all of you know his connection with the, with the world of autism as well. Both of us are very interested in that for both personal and professional reasons. So anyway, we talked them into it. Into, into developing uh, a body of data on uh, children with autism, and, uh, and they did it. Um, so here's a, here's a kind of perspective on the actual sample that we ran this analysis on, and it's carefully selected from within the 80,000 hours of recording uh, to make sure that all of the rec uh, recording was done with exactly the same version of the recorder, and there are good reasons for having done it that way. In any case, there were 106 typically developing kids between 10 and 48 months. There were 77 autistic children between 16 and 48. And then there were a group of children with language delay, but they were not autistic. There were 49 of them, and they were between 10 and 44 months. There were multiple recordings on each child. So all in all, we had 1,486 recordings, uh, 23,000 uh, plus hours of recording, and over 3 million um, machine-identified child utterances were analyzed in the, uh, in the effort. Uh, the kids, of course, were actually rather different in terms of certain kinds of uh, characteristics. And here's a quick view of that. Um, in autism, you see about a 4 or 5 to 1 ratio boys to girls. Um, and in the typical sample, of course, it's more even. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, what we tended to find was that the developmental age, and this is a nonverbal developmental age, 
uh, tended to be higher in the typically developing developing kids, even if their eight, their their real ages were fairly close. Although, the, as it turns out, the, the the autism sample was older as well. In any case, with these kinds of differences, statistically significant differences in every case across this, we deemed it worthwhile to to acquire a subset or to develop a subset of these three groups that was matched on the first three of those parameters. And so we did that. Okay, So this is a subset of uh, 39 typically developing, 39 language delayed, and 35 autistic children that are matched well on gender developmental age and the mother's educational level, which is taken to be the best indicator of socioeconomic status. Um, I'm not going to say anything more about that matched sample. I'll just tell you that all the results are the same, whether we use the, the sample as a whole or the matched sample. Nothing, nothing substantive changes. OK, some basic quantitative results from this analysis. So remember now what we've done is we've taken the samples from all three groups of children. Um, we've uh, evaluated each syllable uh, in terms of how it did or did not meet the requirements of one of those 12 parameters. And when we're finished for each child, actually for each recording, we have a mean number of uh, well, we have a number of vocalizations that, or of syllables that met the criteria for each of those 12 parameters divided by the number of utterances. Right? So it's a sort of proportional amount of meeting of each of those criteria for each child. And this is uh, just a, a, a little overview of this expressed in standard scores. So we convert everything to z-scores. And uh, the blue is going to represent the values for the typically developing kids. The reason they aren't all zero here, because we're just referring now the two other groups to the typically developing kids, is concerned with the fact that we did a part of this uh, calculation. We established the means and standard deviations at the recording level, and then we converted the data to the child level, because each child had at least six recordings. Um, but you can see that, the, uh, for example, on voicing, the uh, autistic and uh, language delayed children showed a great deal less voicing than the typically developing kids did, more than a standard deviation less. Right? They showed a lot less canonical syllable usage. They showed a lot less of this spectral ent entropy that is typical of speech. They showed more squealing, we're not sure why, but less of this low spectral tilt phenomenon. Then some non-significant differences across the middle group of the parameters when we just compare them directly in this way. And then on the uh, parameters associated with duration, uh, they showed far fewer of the syllables that would have been in the sort of right in the middle range for, for speech, uh, fewer in the short range, and many more in the extra long range, the kinds of syllables that would never occur in speech. So these give us just a sort of a panorama of uh, a very, very uh, noticeable differences between the groups uh, in a just sort of a first quick look at um, at how the groups differed with regard to these, uh, these phenomena. But perhaps more interesting and important is uh, how well can we predict age uh, by utilizing these kinds of parameters. And let's start by looking at correlations of the 12 acoustic parameters with age. So uh, it, within each group, there's an, uh, a substantial age range. And so we can develop a correlation for how much of each of these things the child does um, as, or that the children do as they get older, so to speak. So there's a, a very high correlation, almost 0.7, uh, in the typically developing group between age and how much they do this, how much they meet the criterion of voicing. So as they get older, they're producing voicing better. Um, the language delayed group similarly shows a very high correlation. And each of these little asterisks indicates whether or not this is a si significant correlation. We're talking about wildly significant correlation. Um, in fact, all of the correlations for all of the parameters are statistically significant. Sometimes they're negative because the child does less of something across time, which makes sense in the case of squealing, um, and, in and in case of this extra long parameter. Uh, but they're all statistically si significant in the case of the typically developing group. And I'm talking about, that, about, as I said, wildly statistically significant. And they're almost all statistically significant in terms of the language delay group. But very few of them are statistically significant with regard to the, the, to the uh, autism group. So uh, in simple interpretation, uh, uh, the typically developing kids are changing across time with regard to these parameters. And they're changing in ways that is predictable, uh, in, in the main at least, with, uh, with respect to this theoretical perspective that established uh, or that suggested we use these parameters in the first place. 
but the, uh, the group of autistic children were ch changing relatively little with regard to the same parameters across time. Okay, now uh, age prediction in another way. Let's do this in, by multiple uh, linear regression now. And each blue dot represents a recording from a typically developing child across the age range that we had, 10 to 48 months. And what we've done is we've modeled, using the 12 parameters, a pre predicted vocal development age, or let's just call it predicted age, on the base, and, and then plotted it against the real age of the child. And the correlation here uh, at the recording level is 0.76, I think. And if you do it at the child level, it's over 0.8. So uh, the, the model actually is quite powerful in terms of predicting where a what a child's status is, completely independently of anything subjective. This is a 100% objective analysis. And again, established before we even had any data to look at. And, and no changes have been made since. So I often point out to people that, uh, I mean, I don't know whether it's true and I've never tested it, but my guess is this, that this correlation is about as high as you could hope to get in any kind of a developmental circumstance because we have, you have to have variation. Right across across kids and how how they're doing. I mean, no no one expects all kids at at, at the same age to do uh, to, to do just the same. I suspect you wouldn't get a higher correlation with age <clears throat> if you tried to predict it by measuring the child's height. Um, so this is a, a very powerful tool. It turns out and and it surprised us uh, very very substantially. I mean we were surprised when we first saw the differences between the groups as well, but this was actually the first thing we saw was this correlation with age. And I was stunned. Um, it's really quite remarkable that uh, it, just looking at the vocalizations in terms of these parameters that were selected uh, at my desk, uh, that we could get uh, this level of, uh, of, of correlation across time. Now, <clears throat> we're going to plot on the same page based on the uh, regression model that was developed on these uh, 106 typically developing kids. We're going to plot now the uh, recordings for the, the autistic children. And here they are. Um, uh, again, there's a lot of spread, as you might expect. But very notably, the group of the recordings from the, uh, from the autism group uh, falls typically below in predicted vocal development level that of the typically developing kids. And the correlation across time is much lower. In fact, it's not very far from zero. Uh, so we can say, on the basis of this outcome, that the typically developing children change in a predictable way across time with regard to these vocal parameters, and that the, the group of autistic children does not change in the same way across time. It's not true that they don't change across time, because if you model them directly, you get a higher correlation. Not nearly as high as for the typically developing group, but you get a good bit higher than the one that you see here. Uh, but we applied the model of the typically developing kids here. And what we find is that they are not changing across time in the same way that the typically developing kids are. And in the next picture, what you'll see is uh, big diamonds that represent the individual 77 typically um, aut autistic children, just to give you a kind of scope of how, uh, of how, they, how they look uh, as individual children with regard to the regression line in blue of the typically developing group. So I, uh, part time I saw this graph um, and uh, immediately, uh, as soon as the the data were in, and we decided we'd run a multiple regression on it. Um, and we said, well, we're going to write a paper. <laughs> this, is, this, this deserves a, a, a paper. But Partai immediately pointed out that this is actually not the most important analysis for us to do if what we're trying to do is to tell how well this kind of a procedure might, in an automated setting entirely with no human intervention, be able to differentiate between the groups. And of course, he suggested that we use a discriminant analysis or a logistic regression or something to do that. Uh, no, notice that it looks like, according to this graph, that as time passes, uh, the groups are separating more. Right? And it might suggest that if you utilize this kind of procedure, you wouldn't do very well at differentiating the groups at the youngest ages. Right? Okay, so, but remember that this is a linear regression, and it wasn't designed to model the discrepancy between the groups. It was designed to model, uh, model the change in age for the typically developing group. Right, so we go on now to a discriminant analysis, which is going to quantify the potential for an automated approach of this sort to detect anomalies in development. And here's the product of a discriminant analysis with just the autism and, and uh, typically developing group displayed in what we call a bubble plot. Uh, I'm, probably many of you have seen bubble plots before, but I, I particularly like them in this, partic in this setting. 
Um, the way it works is that uh, after the discriminant analysis, you have an estimated posterior probability of autism for each child. Um, and that estimated posterior probability for 26 of the 77 autistic children was nearly 1. And the estimated probability for 27 of the typically developing kids was nearly 0. And you can see what happened across all of the other kids in the middle with varying sizes and bubbles representing varying numbers of children. Um, and if we were to split, say, right about here, just take arbitrarily that kind of criterion for the way we would set up our uh, diagnostic procedure, we could estimate that we would have very few false positives in our, uh, in our, or our, our screening for autism. And we would catch most of the kids with autism using this entirely uh, automated and objective procedure. And if we utilize the equal error probability or the equal correctness probability, we find that, there were, that the, the procedure is a sort of 86% correct for these two samples on both sides. 86% of the typically developing kids are correct, correctly identified as typically developing, and 86% 80, of the autistic children correctly identified as autistic. Um, OK, one last slide, because I know I'm running out of time here. Uh, uh, and I, just to show you the robustness of this procedure, because um, as I say, we were, we were really stunned at uh, the, the first round of results from this. None of us expected very much of this kind of automated approach, because uh, automatic speech recognition is still in a sort of infancy in, in, in the view of most of us who are associated with this, uh, this enterprise. Um, and we didn't think that by working with such complicated things as naturalistic recordings from kids that you'd be able to do much of anything. Um, but in fact, it's very robust. It predicts age very well, and it, and it predicts differences in groups. At a level, I'm not sure whether that 86% correct means a lot to you. In that age range, that approaches the level of the best diagnostic procedures. Um, it, it's not real clear exactly how to make the comparison, because how we've done this and how people go about testing the, uh, the reliability of, uh, of the best of diagnostic procedures is very different. Uh, but, uh, but it's clear it's not far off. Uh, for example, if you take a group of autistic children who have been uh, diagnosed with the so-called ADOS, the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule, which is the sort of gold standard, uh, and you look at them under three years of age and then follow them until they're seven, uh, about 30% of those children who were diagnosed with autism before age three will end up losing the diagnosis by age seven. Um, so uh, it, it may be that this kind of procedure is going to work just about as well as anything that is available currently. Um, and of course, we're using the ADOS and other things like it as our gold standard. What we're, what we're saying when we, we say we've, we've done 86% correct <laughs> identification is we're referencing the diagnoses that were given to us about those children. Um, so anyway, the, there are some other questions about how robust the procedure is. Does it, does it apply across boys and girls? Does it apply across different socioeconomic status? Does it, is it so simple that uh, all the procedure is doing is to find the kids who can't talk. And it recognizes the difference between kids who talk and kids who don't, since autistic kids don't talk so much. Maybe it's, it's just differentiating them because uh, the autistic kids don't talk very much. Okay? Th those are the kinds of questions that were posed to us by the reviewers of BNAS. And so uh, this graph gives you uh, some answers to those questions. Um, so for the whole sample, this is what the, uh, what the picture looks like with a 95% confidence interval uh, on the autism group uh, shown here around a um, mean posterior probability of autism that is something like 0.87, okay? and a mean for the typically developing group that was uh, under 0.1, so 0 0.06 or something like that and the 95% confidence interval around that. So we've got huge group differences, huge group differences. Then we split them into the boys and the girls. The girls are a smaller group, but there were some girls, so we compare the typically developing girls against the autistic girls, and the difference is, is pretty much the same kind of picture. We break them by high socioeconomic status and low socioeconomic status uh, based on the mother's educational level. And again, the, the differences are, uh, are su substantially the same. We use something called the, the, uh, the snapshot language uh, score, which includes a lot of stuff that has to do with gesture as well as speech. So we don't get a, as strong a difference under those circumstances, but we presume it's because it's confounded with all of the stuff that's associated with gesture. But here's the really in interesting one. We ha happen to have a measure um, uh, of expressive, the number of expressive words in the child's vocabularies for both groups. Um, not for every single child, but we had it for enough of them that we were able to match 
uh, a subset of, I think it was 35 children in each group, where they had exactly the same scores. OK, so remember the question, could it be that this is just finding the autistic kids who can't talk? OK, now we're going to compare autistic kids who talk just the same amount as typically developing kids. And this is the difference that we get. Whoops. This one, OK? So we still get a massive difference between the groups, even in that case. So uh, what, what this tells us is that uh, what the automated analysis is doing is it's isolating something about vocalization itself, something about the style and, uh, and way in which vocalization is being implemented. We went through uh, quite an elaborate effort to try to figure out uh, how best to portray what it was about those 12 parameters that was creating this differentiation. And the best that we uh, can come up with at this time, because it's just 12 parameters and we could have tried 10 million, right? Um, the best we came up with was that, uh, that it appeared to be the case that the autistic children were showing less well-formed syllabification across time. So that first group of parameters. Add to it the medium duration one. That first group of parameters was accounting for almost all of this differentiation. The children were, uh, were being differentiated by the extent to which their, their vocalizations could be deemed to be speech-like. Even if they were talking, they weren't necessarily talking in a way where, where, where the vocalizations uh, met all the criteria for canonical syllabification. And I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Oh, quickly, just one last thing. Remember the discriminated analysis and the age question? So here's the, here's the plot when you, uh, when you, when you when simply plot the posterior probabilities uh, for the aut autism sample and the typically developing sample across age. And here it does not look at all like there's any kind of limitation on this kind of method depending on the age of the child. We were doing just as well at the lower ages and discriminating them as, as, as at the upper ages. So there we go. So uh, some questions? Yeah.